We're talking 50 years of Blackula with the co-creator Joan Torres, and we'll be spending the entire hour with her. There was just an article on Forward.com, the Jewish independent nonprofit, called The Saga of Hollywood's Most Terrifying Vampire and His Jewish Parents. 1972's Blackula was the brainchild of a couple of New York movie buffs in New York City. Released in the summer of 1972, Blackula became one of the year's top grossing films. Joan Torres, welcome to the show. Thank you. So it all started at the Fox Venice Theater. It was uh, you and Ray, and you were going to movies at the time. Can you uh, take us there and tell us how did that theater become part of the, maybe the catalyst or one of the jumping off points for uh, a film that became a cult classic, but was also a hit upon its release? Well, it was in the neighborhood, and it was only a dollar, and we didn't have much money, <laughs> so it was a bargain, so to speak. We went to the movies a lot because the Fox Venice was at that time in a predominantly African-American area. That's That was the audience. So we noticed that whenever we went and there was a horror film playing, that the place was packed with black families, even little kids, I mean, little kids. And people would bring, I mean, it was like a picnic. It was really, it was really funny. I mean, I'd never seen that before uh, of, of whole families showing up with a picnic basket and, you know, <laughs> just waiting to scream and it was very funny. It was also your brother uh, who was a professor at Columbia University at the time, uh, also a writer, but working as a theater professor. And he saw an ad in Variety Magazine calling for uh, horror scripts. Right. I mean, he was in the theater, so he was reading Variety all the time. I had written a full length script, a feature by myself, and it's how I got the agent. I got an agent at CMA, uh, which is now something else. I don't know. They keep morphing. He read the script and he wanted to represent me, but he didn't think he could sell the script. So he offered me a Gomer Pyle episode. And I was very discouraged. You know, I'd spent a long time on that script. It was my first feature. And I, I couldn't stomach Gomer Pyle, so I called my brother. I, I, he wants me to write a Gomer Pyle. And I said, nobody's interested in this script. He won't even send it around. It was about junkies in New York. So Andy said, uh, look, I saw ads in Variety for, they're looking for horror scripts. So why don't you try one of those? So that's that was the germ there. And so tell us about Ray. Well, Raymond Koenig came from the South Bronx. His family were immigrants. They were uh, from Eastern Europe. Father was from Poland, mother was from Russia. Uh, they were Jewish. That area was predominantly, when, when he was a little boy, was predominantly Jewish refugees, poor Jewish refugees. And it by the time he hit his teens, it was becoming an African-American area. His uncle had bought one of these run-down old flea-infested movie theaters. Raymond just, that was it. He was hooked. And he was in that theater every single day after school. He was in there. He'd watch the same picture over and over and over and over. And he was just an encyclopedia of film stuff. He, he he particularly liked bad guys, so he knew every single uh, guy who had played a bad guy, and he, and he had, you know, in his head were all these scenes, and he loved horror films. I didn't like horror films. I, they, they, I found them scary, so uh, I wasn't that crazy about doing that, but if it meant going to see horror films, because I didn't like being scared, but he thought it was a joke. You know, uh, like the audience, we'd been seeing it, seeing these things with at the Fox. 
And so you really connected with that audience in a big way. It was the very first horror film with an entirely black cast. Also the very first prominent black vampire on screen. I'm sure there were many more firsts. But I think the... Uh, and maybe we can pick this up uh, in the next segment, but I think one really remarkable thing about it was uh, its success and how unlikely it was to even get made in the first place. Yeah, um, well, uh, it got turned down by every single studio um, and it was, it finally got to Sam Arkoff of American International Pictures, you know, that wonderful house of house of blood and you know uh, you name it what was it the ghost in the bikini uh, <laughs> I mean it was it got to him on a plane you know Freddie Fields at uh, CMA handed him the script on the plane and said you have to read this before we get off and he read it and he said this is exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> There you go. Maybe we can start with uh, William Marshall, since he really becomes the character. He was somebody who uh, became Blackula and really, really brought the story to life. And I know you became friends and so much more. So maybe we can start there. I didn't meet Bill until after the picture was shot. I had gone back east with my husband and my kid. And uh, then the marriage kind of fell apart. and I picked up the kid and came back to the West Coast. And that's when I saw the picture, when I got back to the West Coast. I had been around for the early casting stuff, and he was not on the roster at that point. After I saw the picture, I was just knocked out by his, you know, how he owned that role. And I called him up, and I introduced myself, met with him, and we got to be friends. I did some writing for him after the, I mean, we got written off the second picture. After we turned in our first draft, we didn't hear anything. And we didn't see anything of that second picture until much later. I got to go to, to the set on the second picture. It was a big deal for them to let a writer on the set, you know? I think the lower the budget, the, the bigger the egos, you know? But the producer knew that Bill and I were friends. And the set was a house they'd rented out in Pasadena that was going to pass for this plantation in the second picture. Bill's dressing room was the master bedroom upstairs. And there was also a, a gay uh, interracial couple in the film. That was another first for Blackula. Yeah. Well, Raymond was gay. We just love the idea of a vampire cruising. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was that. And also, you know, it seemed like who would pick up a coffin in Transylvania and take it back to the city to use as a guest bed? It it had to be interior decorators, they had to be gay. Big thing was the was the love story. I mean, there had always been a sexual component to vampires but there was never a love story. And, and we had to really fight to keep that love story in there. And I, I personally think that that combined with the fact that he's this noble character, you know, he's this prince from Africa who goes to Europe to try to stop the slave trade and just runs into the wrong guy. You know, I thought it was very important that the character not be a villain. One way to make him a sympathetic character is to give him some real emotional bonding with somebody. More than anything, I think that that was one of the things that's made the film hang on, is that it's got a heart in the middle of it, that he be a sympathetic character. It's um, often referred to an, as an exploitation film, but that's not exactly what it is. Uh, you described it as a a horror film with a black cast. And so please expand on that if you can. The publicity booklets that they would send out to the theater owners and the distributors, they talk about exploitation, that it's an exploitation film. 
I thought of exploitation as being like superfly and slaughter and black Caesar. For me, Blackula was uh, just a black vampire movie. It had an all pretty much all black cast. It held up you know it, it people were still able to watch it people were still doing midnight screenings of it do, do you feel uh vindicated not just by the response when it uh opened in uh in all those different cities with uh sold out shows but also that it it kept playing and that uh it became um part of the nomenclature of the culture yeah i i mean i was surprised <laughs> Like I said before, I, I really think that the fact that he was a, he wasn't your standard vampire, not just that he was a different color, but that he, you know, he was an emotional guy with a heart who was still in love with his wife. And I, I think that that dimension of making him so warm and not just staying with the scares and the screams. Most vampire pictures are about blood, you know, somebody wants to feed. And so the love story in the script was bigger, but the studio changed the ending. Yeah, we had this kind of ambiguous romantic ending because we thought the second picture was gonna be Son of Blackula. And uh, I had done all this research on the islands and whatnot because it was going to entail voodoo and trying to turn the kid into a real, you know, who starts to show signs at some point. In other words, Tina survives. So uh, in order for her to survive, you can't kill her off in the first picture, as well as Bill. That whole ending sequence winds up in a sewer in a sewage treatment plant. I think it was shot in Long Beach in the sewage treatment plan, plant. And in the melee, she gets killed. And in order to save her, he bites her. So then they have an excuse to have her come out of the coffin and, and have to kill her. And when he sees that, he commits suicide. Did you have any uh, strong feelings about that ending at the time? Yeah, I was shocked. <laughs> Wasn't the kind of shock you want in a horror film. But mainly, you know, it, it, I mean, it stayed with the nobility of the character in that he, he, he bites her to save her. And he, uh, and when he can't save her, he, he dies. So I think I, I wrote that I, I was working with a Polish playwright. Janusz Kowalski, and uh, years later, and he said, no, I really want to see this picture. <laughs> hey, I'll run it for you. So I ran it. When it got to the end, he said, suicide, John? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, you talked earlier a lot about William Marshall, but we didn't really get to his activism. He was... Uh, an activist at a time it was very dangerous to be a black activist in america also a very distinguished actor uh please tell us a little bit more about william marshall he came from one of the steel towns in the midwest and so he got some good roles in the 50s demetrius and the gladiators lydia bailey something of value and he he was campaigning hard for the civil rights movement which hadn't really started yet i mean we're talking mid 50s, early 50s. And he got what he called whitelisted. He couldn't think he after a while he couldn't get a job. So he did what a lot of blacklisted writers and producers and actors did. He left the country. He went to Europe and he toured with Othello for years had a, a reputation as a classical actor. Your great grandfather was a notable poet, Morris Rosenfeld. And he wrote the Requiem on the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Yes. And it was a fire trap. And the, these women were on the third or fourth floor. Once the fire started, there was no getting them out. I mean, it was something like, I don't know, 150 who died. He wrote a Requiem 
poem about it. He was one of the first Yiddish poets to write in America. He was called the sweatshop bard because he worked in a sweatshop like a lot of the Jewish immigrants did when they first got here uh, on the Lower East Side of New York on Broom Street, actually. Well, Joan, you'll have to come back next year so we can do 50 years of Scream, Blackula, Scream. Everybody, this was 50 years of Blackula with co-creator Joan Torres. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week.